Thanks everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. So let's start a bit about me. So I'm a CPython core developer since uh, June 2009. Uh, I did uh, like uh, teach Python programming at the Turku University of Applied Science and also other places like uh, with Franco uh, for the gravitational waves and present several talks at EuroPython and PyCon Italy and PyCon Finland. Uh, most of them were about uh, Unicode or, the, or uh, C Python. And uh, I live in Finland for 10 years and I traveled through four continents so far and I know more or less four languages, uh, human languages, not programming languages. And uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, I started studying Chinese. And uh, uh, I studied it with uh, no formal training. So what I did was mostly using uh, apps like uh, Memrise, Duolingo, uh, LingoDeer, and others. And uh, I haven't followed any course or read any book. Uh, it's just everything on my own. And uh, I also use uh, uh, Python to help myself. So this talk, uh, during this talk, uh, I'm going to talk uh, uh, mostly about uh, Chinese. So don't expect uh, too much Python. Um, but there's also a bit of Python because as I said, uh, I learn Chinese by myself and uh, I use Python to help uh, this uh, learning uh, process. So if you don't know what Chinese is, it's uh, just the most widely used language in the world. And uh, it has 1.2 billion native speakers it's so over 3,000 uh, years old, and uh, uh, it has 100 of local dialects, two writing system, over 200 radicals, 10 of thousand of characters, and almost 100,000 words. So it, it seems uh, uh, quite complicated. And uh, there's also uh, many people consider Chinese to be one of the most difficult languages to learn, uh, but it's actually not that difficult. And we will see, uh, after we talk, hopefully you will have an idea of how Chinese works, and you will see that it's actually not that difficult. So this is Chinese and uh, Python. If you don't know what's Python, is a pretty cool language, uh, which happens to have a pretty cool Unicode support uh, that is very useful when you're uh, uh, working, uh, for example, with Chinese. And um, uh, for example, you have uh, the rep, uh, this is Python 3. Uh, not Python 2. Uh, the wrapper is uh, uh, printed as uh, Unicode characters directly, so it's very convenient. You don't see Unicode escapes that you cannot read. And uh, this is actually a, a valid piece of Python free code uh, since it allows you uh, to use uh, uh, Unicode uh, characters, uh, not all of them, but uh, let's say letter like characters uh, for variables. Uh, I can write a comment in Chinese. I can define a function. Uh, this is a simple function that just outputs a low word. Uh, this is a message, so a variable called message, uh, which is equal to the string hello world, and then it prints the message. When I call the function, it prints hello world. So this is a valid piece of uh, Python free code. Okay, so before we start uh, uh, learning about Chinese, uh, how many of you here know something about Chinese? Okay, couple. Is there any Chinese here, native speaker or anything? No? Okay, so <laughs> as I said, I studied it mostly on my own. So what I said, I, I did my research, so it should be pretty accurate. But uh, uh, there might be some uh, slight mistake here and there. But uh, if there's no Chinese here, no one should notice. <laughs> okay, so before focusing on, on Chinese in particular, let's uh, uh, Let's look a bit uh, at the uh, several writing systems that exist. So the three main categories uh, that we have uh, is the alphabetic uh, uh, writing systems, uh, which is the ones you are probably most familiar with. So all the, most of the European languages, uh, English, Italian, German, they, are, they all use uh, letters to represent phonemes. And uh, also languages such as uh, uh, Russian with Cyrillic or Greek. And uh, then we have other languages uh, that use uh, symbols that represent syllables. And these are called syllabic languages. And then we have uh, logographic, that use symbols to represent whole words. 
So these are all examples of alphabetic languages. So here, every uh, letter corresponds to a specific sound, and when you combine them, you get a word. So we have Latin, Greek, Cyrillic, or Runic. Then we have syllabic uh, languages. Uh, the most popular uh, is probably Japanese, that actually uses three different systems together, uh, but uh, hiragana and katakana, which are actually two sets uh, that they correspond, so for, for each, they are like alternatives. So this letter corresponds to this one, this one to this one, and uh, each of these uh, represents a syllable. And this is also another language, Cherokee, that is also syllabic. Is probably no one knows about this, but is another example. So here you can see, for example, uh, this uh, character here, each one of them represents one syllable. So for example, we have uh, the first five is ra, ri, ru, re, ro, or this one in uh, uh, katakana is ma, mi, mu, me, mo, or this one in Cherokee is la, li, lu, le, lo. And here we have some words. So for example, samurai is written like sa, mu, ra, i. So four characters, each one represents a syllable. Or arigato is a, ri, ga, to. Camera, this is the same as uh, uh, in English, so ka, me, ra. Toilet is to, i, re. So it sounds similar to English, but you see that every uh, symbol, every character represents uh, a different syllable. And this guy here, by the way, was the name of uh, this sequoia, was the name of the guy who uh, wrote down uh, and invented this uh, um, alphabet used by the uh, Cherokee, because before we only spoke the language, we didn't have any writing system. Finally, we have uh, logographic, uh, which are actually very old. So you see something like uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs or uh, cuneiform scripts, um, and also Chinese. All these use symbols that represent words. So each of these symbols, you can see here we have the upside down uh, man, or we have the jumping goat or the turtle. I have no idea what these are, it's like some alien spaceship thing. And then here we have Chinese. So all these uh, are called logographic. And uh, as you can see, every uh, symbol represents a whole word. So for example, the, this character in Chinese uh, means man or a person. And uh, in hieroglyphics, uh, I didn't find a, a regular man. We only had dancing men or upside down men. I don't know what, but the closest I found was like the, the man here. And uh, this is apparently in uh, cuneiform. Uh, uh, this means man or male. And uh, in Chinese, this uh, character here means snake. Uh, this one, I, I guess it means snake in hieroglyphs. And uh, cuneiform, we didn't have it probably because it's difficult to make a snake since it's all round with the, so we didn't have it. And uh, another thing uh, that uh, uh, probably useful to know, so w when you see like some uh, uh, Asian, uh, Asian script, you probably don't distinguish between Japanese or Korean or Chinese. You say like some Chinese thing, or it's not clear. It's actually very easy to distinguish them. So here is uh, uh, three uh, pieces of text in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. This is actually the, uh, just like the first sentence on the Wikipedia page, this is for Chinese, this is for Japanese, this is for Korean. So you can notice the, the difference. So let's start with Korean, which is the easiest one. It's the only one that has this kind of circle or round, um, with uh, round marks uh, in the characters. So if you see these round things uh, or uh, perpendicular lines, that's Korean, very easy to recognize. Uh, Japanese is uh, usually actually a mix of three different sets of characters. So one uh, is the kanji that are uh, the same or like uh, they, they come from the Chinese character. So you see uh, several of these are very similar. For example, this one, uh, this is uh, Nihongo. Uh, it means uh, uh, Japanese language. This go here, uh, it's uh, the same character as this one, Hanyu. This uh, in this language. So you see this symbol and this symbol. This is pronounced uh, U in, uh, um, in Chinese, this is Go in Japanese, but we're actually the same character that means language. And uh, Japanese also has all these things that are hiragana. And you can recognize because they are fairly simple in shape 
and they are round, like uh, cursive. And it also uses uh, a katakana, but mostly for foreign words or for other special occasion. So you don't see any katakana here. Um, but if you see a mix of this uh, simple and round character with uh, other character that looks like this, that's Japanese. And Chinese uh, instead is uh, pretty regular looking. So all the characters uh, feel more or less a square and uh, they have uh, quite a few lines. They don't have any circles like Koreans. So they are kind of uh, a square, but not all of them. Uh, there are like some shapes, like for example, this one that are a bit round, but most of them are quite full character and they are like square shapes. Any questions so far? No. So let's continue uh, and let's see. So Chinese, uh, we say it is a logographic language, but logographic is a pretty general uh, category. Uh, there are actually subcategories and uh, we are going to learn more about uh, log logographic languages, uh, in particular uh, in uh, Chinese. So logographic, we say that uh, we have characters that represent, uh, we have characters and, and symbols uh, that represent uh, a word or even a phrase. And uh, we can uh, subdivide uh, this category in uh, three subcategories. So we have pictograms, uh, that they represent a physical object by illustration. So you see all the hieroglyphs I showed you before, the man standing on his head uh, was just a picture of a man standing on his head. So that's pretty straightforward. What you see in, uh, in the drawing, in the picture, is uh, the word uh, that it represents. Then we have uh, ideograms uh, that instead of uh, representing some physical object that you can see and you can draw, represent uh, something more abstract, like an idea or a concept. And um, these simple, these uh, ideograms are further divided in simple and compound. And finally, we have uh, phonosemantic compounds. So we have, uh, they're actually uh, similar to compound pseudograms, except that one part uh, is there to represent the meaning, so the idea, the concept. The other part is there to represent the sound. So let's see a few examples here. So these are pictograms. So this thing here is actually a Chinese character uh, that represents a, a tortoise or a turtle. Uh, as you can see here, these are supposed to be the legs. This is the shell on the back. This is the tail. And this one is the head. Maybe these are the eyes. I don't know. But this is a pictogram. Even if you don't know what it means, you can, with a bit of fantasy, guess that this might be a tortoise. Then we have this one, also quite easy to guess. This uh, is the Chinese character for fire. So this one looks like a fire burning. Then we have this other one here that represents a tree. So it's like, a bit like a Christmas tree with a trunk in the middle and then like, branches going down. So these are uh, pictograms. So they represent a physical object. It's just like a drawing of a physical object. When we have simple ideograms, so they represent uh, um, idea or concepts. So two examples, uh, we saw here the character for tree. So if we want to indicate the idea of uh, root or origin, uh, we can take the tree and make a mark on this part here to indicate something that stands at the bottom. And uh, if you want to indicate the opposite, so the tip or the end, we can use uh, this tree with a mark at the top to indicate the tip. So for example, uh, the word weekend uses this character to indicate the end of the week. And this one, I think, uh, uh, in uh, Japanese, let's see, uh, this one, riben. Uh, so in Japanese it's like riben, in, in, uh, in Chinese it's riben, in, uh, in Japanese it's uh, nihon, but this one means the origin of the sun. That's because uh, the, uh, Japan was on the east, so where the sun rises, you, you can also see it from their flag. So this is the origin, so where the sun comes from, because it rises at the east. So Japan literally means origin of the sun. So you can see like this uh, ideograms can be used to represent uh, the origin and the tip. These are other simple ideograms, the number one, two, three are simply one line, two lines, and three lines. And it gets a bit more complicated, but at least this one 
uh, are simple ideograms. Then we have compound ideograms. So when you take some uh, simple ideograms and put them together, you can get more complex ones. For example, if you take a tree, you put it next to another tree, you have woods, so small forest. If you put uh, even another tree on the top, you have actually a bigger forest. And actually, the, the real word for forest is a combination of these two characters. So you actually, to, to write forest in Chinese, you actually have to draw uh, five trees. Um, we also have uh, other, for example, this one. So this, on the left part, uh, is a uh, uh, character for person, uh, which is a bit squished, uh, so it, it has like a, the shape is a bit di different. But this one means man, and this one is tree. So this character indicates a man next to a tree, probably sitting or uh, lying on the tree. Uh, it means to rest. So this kind of character uh, use uh, put together two existing ideograms and uh, make uh, a new character that has uh, a new meaning. Then we have uh, these uh, so-called phonosemantic compounds. So this character has a phonetic part and uh, a semantic part. These are actually the most, uh, uh, most commonly used in Chinese, so you, you get a lot of this. And um, um, for example, here, this character means uh, ocean, and uh, this other character here means oxygen. And uh, if we take them apart, you can see that this one, so this uh, left part of the character, it actually indicates water. And this right part here, it actually indicates ship. So the ocean is not the water of the ship, or the water where the ship swim, or anything to do with ship. The ship is only there to indicate the pronouns. So the semantic part is this one, water. This one is the phonetic part. So you can see that this character is pronounced uh, young because uh, uh, the pronunciation comes from here, but the meaning comes uh, from this side. Similarly, uh, we have this uh, character, uh, oxygen, uh, that is uh, composed by, again, uh, the ship, and uh, here this uh, other character uh, that is, uh, means gas. So oxygen, again, is not uh, the ship gas, or the gas produced by the ship, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, it's actually, so this one is, is a bit, uh, uh, because I was reading the etymology of this character, there are some people that say that this is not only phonetic, but it actually has uh, some semantic meaning indicating that oxygen is the gas needed by the sheep and by extension all the animals to live. Uh, but uh, this theory is not uh, confirmed uh, because it's difficult to trace down the etymology of all this character. But uh, it's quite clear that here again, the uh, sheep uh, is also having a, a I mean, for sure it has a phonetic role, since uh, it gives uh, the pronunciation of this character. It might also have a semantic role as well. Um, and another very interesting thing, uh, since we are already talking about languages, we are already a bit off topic, let, let's go a step further, let's, let's talk about chemistry. Um, this is uh, the periodic table of elements uh, in Chinese. You can see every element has uh, um, their own Chinese character to represent them. The advantage of these uh, phono, um, phonosemantic compounds uh, is that uh, if you can recognize the semantic compounds, you can already get an idea of what the character is about. So if you look here, for example, do you notice that all, all these characters here in the blue uh, and also uh, something like this one or that one, the yellow one over there, they all have this uh, gas here. And in fact, the blue ones are the noble gas. Um, we have like uh, um, the xenon, uh, the helium. Yeah, I'm not so good in chemistry. And uh, also we have here, for example, the oxygen, which is a gas, and um, hydrogen there is another gas. So all of this uh, have this uh, gas uh, radical. Uh, you can also notice, for example, all this one here, you see on the left, they all have uh, this symbol here. This is the symbol for metal. So all this one are metals. So here, for example, uh, we have lead, uh, or we have 
have uh, this is actually gold uh, but all this one you see here these are all metals you can see there are some where did it go I saw it the other day like uh, this one or this one uh, silicon no this is uh, silicon should be or arsenic this uh, have this other radical on the left uh, that is the one to represent stone so it's not a metal but it's some kind of uh, a uh, solid element that is stone. Another uh, interesting one that you're, you're probably familiar with is HG, not the version control system, the actual element, which sits right here. And you see the bottom here. So HG is kind of a metal, but uh, it doesn't have the metal uh, radical like all the others, like the, the, this uh, um, semantic component. But it has this one at the bottom, uh, but it actually this means water. So if you didn't know anything uh, about Chinese uh, except uh, just a few words uh, or a few components, you would already be able to spot uh, and remember that this one here uh, is uh, Hg, mercurial, because uh, it's liquid at uh, uh, room temperature. And you can remember all this one are gases and uh, all this one are metals and others are kind of stone-like and so on. So in this way, the Chinese character can already provide a lot of information. So if you see a character that you have never seen before, uh, sometimes you can guess at least more or less the category or what it's about, more or less. And since most of these characters uh, have both a phonetic and a semantic category, you can also guess more or less how it's going to sound. So this, uh, they are complicated, but in this complexity, uh, you have uh, this information that can be uh, really useful. So now that we know more or less uh, how Chinese work, let's go uh, a bit deeper and uh, let's see uh, what's the structure uh, of Chinese. And um, I mentioned that I use Python to learn Chinese. So what I did, uh, there is this uh, C edict, it's called, uh, which is uh, a text file basically containing uh, is like a dictionary containing uh, a lot of uh, Chinese uh, terms, including characters, radicals, words, uh, and even like some uh, like brand names or names of famous uh, actors or uh, celebrities, uh, presidents, uh, and whatever. Uh, and there's like one per line, and we have all uh, these entries. And this is uh, is like. A, it's free, you can download it, you can parse it, you can do whatever you want. So it's a very useful resource uh, that can be used to learn uh, Chinese. So that's what I did. So I took this uh, file, I uh, parsed it, I put all the information in a database, I added more sources that I found elsewhere, and I created a database with all the information I, I could possibly need by, like when learning, um, learning Chinese. And uh, every entry includes uh, uh, in the C edict, the traditional simplified pinyin definition and classifiers, but we will see uh, soon what we are. Um, so I parsed all of this and created a script that helps me uh, learn Python. So what I can get out of this script? So first we need to understand uh, a little bit better how these uh, characters, words, uh, sentences are made. So let's see a few examples here. So the smallest unit that you can have uh, in a Chinese character is called radical. So when before I was showing you the phonosemantic components, each of these components was actually a radical. And um, you can decompose a character, so break it down in uh, uh, its radical, but they can be, you can, only, you can have one, two, three, four, and uh, even more. Um, there are actually very complex characters that are not used like uh, so often or they are just like for some specific purposes or like just for design but have actually hundreds of uh, strokes so you see this one has two this one has one two three four uh, there are characters that are so complex they have hundreds uh, these are not really used but there are some that are actually used that have uh, like over 30 or 40 strokes and um, uh, these radicals are also used for dictionary lookup so this is something, maybe you never wonder about it, but how do you find a word on a Chinese dictionary? Um, so the way you do uh, is uh, you identify uh, what's the main radical, 
and there you have to guess a bit because it's not always clear which one is it. And uh, you go under the section with all the words that have that radical, and then you count the uh, strokes of the remaining part. So if we have some example that I can show you, uh, I'll just skip, no, let's skip behind. Uh, for example, here, or this one, okay, this one is easier. So I go under the water radical, and I see that this one has one, two, three, four, five, six strokes. So I go in the section for the water characters, go on the line for a character that have six additional strokes, and then I have a list, and among the list I can find the right characters. So this is one of the use of radicals. Uh, and uh, if they are used semantically, they can also suggest the meaning. So for example, we saw before all the examples uh, with the gas uh, or uh, with the metal. And um, they may also have different variants. So for example, we saw the rest, the man standing next to the tree. Uh, this one and this one are actually the same character, but they have variation. Because when we get combined, you cannot get this one, you don't have enough space, or even this one, so you have uh, smaller variants. And uh, some of these, uh, like the one you see here, are, are also character on their own. So this is actually one of the main problems I had when I had to, to make this uh, database. So in the database it was fine, but if I want to represent this with an object-oriented API, uh, and I get something like this. This character, for example, is uh, a radical, but is also a character, but is also a word, depending on the context. So when you have to create an instance of a class, you don't actually know without context uh, if you want to create a radical instance or uh, a, a character instance or a word instance. So this is a bit tricky. And these radicals, there are uh, 214 uh, um, that are recognized as radicals, and uh, uh, about 50 of them are very common to other, like this one, uh, they get like, we are just using in some cases. And uh, all these characters can be combined and form uh, words. And um, so in Chinese there are, uh, no, not words, uh, excuse me. Uh, you can combine these radicals to make characters. So here, uh, in uh, the C-Dict, uh, we have uh, 13,000 uh, characters, so individual characters, but the one that are commonly used are about three, 4,000. Here it's very difficult to estimate because it's very big numbers, so you have different sources uh, with different numbers, but apparently it's about three, three, 4,000 uh, characters that are commonly used. And uh, theoretically, these characters are an open set because uh, you can uh, combine uh, different radicals to make new characters. Uh, this doesn't happen often, but for example, uh, brand names or uh, we saw the chemical elements, when we find the new elements, we have to make up a new symbol to represent that element. So for example, if we find a new metal, we will probably take the metal radical and then uh, we might take uh, another phonetic character that usually resembles the, um, the name of the, the English name. So for example, the lithium, uh, they call it Li. So they have uh, uh, a phonetic part that sounds like Li and uh, a semantic part that indicates the type of elements. And uh, these characters are not only used by Chinese, but as we saw, they are also found in Japanese uh, as kanji uh, that are quite like very popular. Uh, in Korean, anji, this is already less popular, like Korean, uh, they mostly use their own alphabet, and uh, before they use uh, uh, the same Chinese character, but at some point they design their uh, alphabet from scratch and start using that, and they don't want to use Chinese anymore. And also Vietnamese, uh, before they also use Chinese characters, and now they basically don't use it anymore and they use a uh, uh, Latin alphabet with a lot of weird uh, diacritic marks. And uh, I can show you here, if it works. So I made this uh, um, Jupyter uh, notebook. So here uh, I put all the characters uh, on the database, and uh, if I do this uh, select query, you can see that uh, I have uh, 13,217 characters. 
and um, and these characters here. Okay. These characters here can be further combined into words. Uh, there are uh, about, here again, the numbers varies depending on the source, but we say there are about 85,000 words. And uh, these words can be made by one or more character, but mostly they are made of two characters. And here again, I can show you. So if we go down here, Uh, and I run this one. So here in uh, um, the C dict, I have one um, one hundred sixteen thousand entries. But this it also includes radicals and some like names that are not uh, strictly words. But uh, you see, there are like quite a lot of them. And uh, if we go further down, let's see if this works. Okay. So this is also another interesting thing that um, that I did with Python. So after I put everything in this database, I basically was able to do some data mining and uh, uh, see, like, recognize some patterns. And for example, here is quite clear that most of the words. So these are the number of characters per words. And from here, you can see quite clearly that there are some. Uh, 15,000 uh, characters that, uh, 15,000 words that are made of one character. Most of them, over 50,000, have two characters. Some have three, some have four, and then five, six are, are like increasingly rare. So most of the uh, Chinese words uh, are made of two characters. And, um, okay. And this uh, uh, words, I have some example here. Uh, for example, the first one here, Shui uh, Guo, it means fruit. Uh, these two characters, the first one, you already saw it before, it means water. And this one on the right means fruit. So it sounds a bit weird the way it works, because to say fruit, we basically say uh, water, fruit. This is also because, uh, as we will see soon, the set of uh, syllables used by Chinese is quite restricted. So if you just say Guo, there are hundreds of characters uh, that, are, uh, that use this syllable, maybe with different tones. We will also see next to what we are. So in order to disambiguate, they usually combine two characters uh, to r represent a new word, uh, which is, uh, when you speak, uh, as like a, uh, a dis distinct sound. So it's easier to recognize. And for example, this. Um, uh, other word, uh, it means apple, pinguo, and you see here it uses again the fruit. So even if you don't know the words, so if you see something like this and you don't know what this means, you can already guess it's probably some kind of fruit. And this character you see here, uh, this ping, it actually doesn't mean anything on its own. It's only using this word uh, to represent apple. So basically this, you could say that it's like saying apple fruit. But this character, you will never use it like on its own. When you want to see apple, you always say apple fruit. And um, this other one here, you probably all know the Japanese word kawaii, which means cute, is like uh, and popular. Uh, it's actually similar and is actually written exactly the same way uh, as the, this Chinese word, which is uh, kai. Uh, this two character actually means, uh, so the, the meaning of the word is like uh, cute or uh, lovable. And these two characters, so this one means uh, to love, and this one means can. So this is something that can be loved. Something that can be loved is uh, cute or uh, lovable. And another interesting set of words I have here. You see all these three words uh, start with the same uh, character. And this character here means uh, electricity. So if you combine the electricity with the speech, or talk character, you get electric talk, which is basically telephone. And if you combine it with uh, electric watch, which means to watch or to see, you get electric watching, it means uh, television. And if you combine it with this other character here, that means uh, brain, you get electric brain, is a computer. So you see here, uh, there is this uh, kind of cool uh, 
pattern where you build the pieces on top of each other and uh, you reach a point where you have enough information that even if you don't know anything, for example here, this radical here, it, it's uh, used to represent moon, but also uh, meat or something uh, like flesh. Um, so this one, uh, it's uh, very common to indicate uh, organs or part of the body. So I, if I don't know this character, I can guess this is maybe some organ thing and this is some electricity. Is a bit far-fetched from guessing computer from there, but it already gives you some int. This uh, radical here, it looks like a lowercase uh, uh, e, um, i. Uh, this one, it's used to indicate something related to uh, words or speech or text. So this one, um, it's, uh, you can guess, and actually I think this one on the right means tongue. So you have electricity, you have a speech, you have tongue. So maybe you, you can guess more or less what we are talking about. And uh, if you think about this, uh, it's actually not that different from what we do uh, from, from some English word or even more uh, in Italian. So we have words uh, like uh, television. It's actually uh, a compound word uh, from tele, which means uh, far away or distance, and vision, that means seeing. So television here, uh, it means seeing from a distance or seeing something that is far away. Or telephone is like phone is a sound and tele is again far away. So telephone is a de device that allows us to hear sounds that are far away, like someone speaking on the other side of the world. And uh, when we see these words, uh, uh, we actually just take them as they are. So when you see telephone, you're thinking about something like this, or maybe the old one, uh, like the old kind of telephone, but you don't think about some sound that you can hear from a distance. So even if this one looks a bit weird, like uh, water fruit or electric speech, uh, when you actually see it, you don't think about electric speech. It works exactly like we do. So when you see it, you know that's a telephone. Okay, no. here. And here I have a, another few examples. Uh, I found the name of the animals were uh, quite, quite entertaining. entertaining. For example, the panda is actually a uh, shong mao, uh, which means uh, bear cat. So the panda is like some kind of bear cat. And uh, the giraffe is actually chang jin lu. Lu means deer. Chan, chang means long, and this one uh, means uh, neck. So the giraffe is the deer with the long neck, very long neck. And uh, this one, the goldfish, is actually goldfish. So it's exactly like the English one. And again, when you uh, hear the word goldfish, you're not thinking about a fish uh, made of solid gold. You actually think at a, at a small red one. So it works uh, uh, the same in Chinese. So even if it feels funny that you have some long neck deer instead of a giraffe, it's actually the same. And finally, there's also a way in Chinese to represent uh, foreign words. So for example, the word for uh, coffee, it's cafe. So here they just took uh, two characters that kind of sound similar and combined them to make uh, a new word that sounds like the English one. Uh, they do this often for foreign names, or for example, for country names. For example, Italy is called Italy. So these are three characters that they, they have like a completely different meaning, but they are combined because their sound is the same uh, or it's similar to the English one. Another example here is uh, Milan. Uh, so these two characters actually means rice, and this one is uh, some uh, lotus, I think. So. They are basically saying rice lotus, but the sound when we pronounce it is Milan, so it sounds similar uh, to the name of the city. Okay, and um, the last step of building is sentences. So we saw the radicals, you put them together, you get characters. You take the characters, you put them together, and you get words. You take the words, you put them together, and you make sentences. So this is one of the coolest part of Chinese. So Chinese in a way is very hard because you have all these characters, but the grammar is surprisingly, surprisingly easy. 
um, is much easier than uh, the grammar of uh, some European languages. So, for example, uh, we have a lot of particles that are used to indicate tenses or possessor rulers. So this is very uh, easy to use. You don't have to remember uh, all the conjugation and irregular verbs uh, or uh, different tenses and modes. Uh, you can just use a particle and make any uh, verb to the past or to some other, um, some other tense. Uh, on the downside, you don't have any space between the words. So sometimes it's difficult to parse. And that's also an interesting uh, programming uh, problem, like uh, trying to figure out where a word begins and ends. So here I have a, a, a very nice example. I was quite surprised when I, when I just started learning, like finding out this was like quite surprising because uh, by just knowing a few characters, so I learned that this character means I or me. And this other character here, uh, it's a plural particle. It's used to make pronoun plurals. No, it doesn't work for all the characters, it's just like from, for pronouns. And finally, this one is the possessive particle. And this is actually used for a lot of things in Chinese. It's a very powerful character, let's say. So what happens if I start combining them? So for example, if I want to say we or us, it's basically me, plural. So I take this one and this one and combine it, and I get me, plural, it's we or us. If I want to say my or mine, I just take uh, I and I add the possessive particles and I get wode, which is my or mine. If I want to say ours, I can just combine uh, me, plural, possessive. And by doing this, I can, uh, you just need to learn the three characters for uh, uh, I, you, and uh, he, she. And combining with this, uh, you can make all the plural form, all the possessive form. So you have these uh, simple rules, these simple particles, and by combining them, you can create uh, new words easily. And, um, mm -hmm. and I think I actually had some more slides here that I forgot. Uh, or maybe not. No, it's later. OK. So let's continue. So these are a few examples of uh, simple sentences. And another thing I was mentioning here, they follow the same uh, order, uh, SVO, subject, verb, object, uh, that we use in English or Italian or several other, uh, I think even in German or other uh, European languages. So first the subject, then the verb, then the object. So we have uh, these examples. So for example, I eat an apple. I have uh, the first character here, that is this one, that means I. So I eat, this one means one, and this one apple, the one we just learned. If I want to say I eat uh, this apple or the apple, I can just replace this one, that means one, that you already saw uh, before, with this other character that means this. And there's also another character that means that. If I want to say I eat my apple, I replace the article here with this one. If I want to say I eat three apples instead of one, I put the three here. If I want to say I'm eating an apple, I have this particle here that basically does the same as the ing in English. So if I put this one just before the verb, uh, it means that I'm uh, actually doing that action. The cool thing is that I can put this one in front of any verb and it will work. So I don't have to worry about irregular verbs or verbs that work differently. I can just put this one. So if I want to learn uh, the ing form, let's say, of English in Chinese, I just need to learn this character and just know to put it before the verb. If I want to say, I have eaten an apple, there's this other character that goes just after the verb. This character indicates that an action uh, has terminated. So this one, it means I've eaten an apple. The apple is gone. And um, uh, if I want to ask a question, like, have you eaten an apple? There is this other particle here that it works like an interrogation mark. So it's used for a Boolean question where you answer yes or no. So by adding this one, I can make a question. If I want to say, uh, have you ever eaten apples? I just put this other particle here that is uh, used to indicate things experienced in the past. So you see now, I 
probably you won't remember all these characters here, but it's just like a few characters, and I've already covered basically all the verbs that there are in Chinese. Uh, they don't use the future, actually. Like, uh, there is some way, but usually if you say, like, uh, uh, tomorrow I go back home. Even in English, you can use the present, and you understand that I'm talking about the future by the fact I put the word tomorrow. In Chinese, it works the same. Uh, in most Asian countries, the concept of future, uh, it's a bit different from what we have here. So they don't have the future tenses the same way as we do. Okay, so um, we don't have too much time, so let's finish. Uh, there's like two more things. So written Chinese, uh, uh, there are actually two different sets. So maybe you heard about the traditional and simplified. Uh, there are actually two ways of writing. Um, because the traditional system was uh, um, appear like it's actually very old, so appear during the Han Dynasty, and uh, it was mostly stable by the fifth century, and uh, uh, it it has the problem that is like a bit complicated. So if you see here, for example, this character here or this character here, they're actually the same as the one we have right below, but the one above we have like more strokes, more complicated to learn. So in an effort to uh, improve lit literacy in uh, the Chinese population, uh, they introduced this uh, simplified form in 1954 uh, that is based on the traditional characters, but is like simpler to read and write. And uh, the traditional form uh, is still used in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau, and uh, uh, also in US, because uh, most of the immigrants in US went there uh, before 1954, so they only knew the traditional, so uh, they use, uh, um, they write in traditional. Um, but in mainland Ch China, uh, they uh, mostly use the simplified. So here I have a few examples. Uh, this uh, turtle we saw before is simplified this way, much easier to write. And it still kind of looks the same. And this other one here, the horse character, uh, it looks like this, now it looks like this. And uh, once you learn, for example, a radical like this one, you can automatically recognize all the characters. So here on the left, uh, we have uh, the traditional forms. So once this one is changed as this one, also inside other characters, the same change happens. So you can recognize. And uh, um, so here we also see another interesting thing. All this uh, here have the ors as a phonetic part, so they're all pronounced ma. But we have different uh, diacritic marks, which are actually the tones. And um, we will see uh, now, like in a bit, what these are. But before, I want to talk a bit about pinyin. So you, you saw that I wrote this here, this one here, using uh, the Latin alphabet. Uh, this is called romanization. So it's writing uh, some foreign uh, alphabet uh, using uh, our own characters. And uh, this kind of uh, romanization that I did is called uh, pinyin. I mean, I didn't make it, I just wrote it down. And, uh, um, but it uses Latin alphabet to represent Chinese characters. And uh, it also indicates the tones uh, with either the diacritics or a number. So diacritics are these uh, signs you see here, like kind of accents. Or a number, you can put like, for example, this one is a one, this one is a three. So you can put a number at the end. And, uh, how do you type Chinese? So this is a standard Chinese keyboard. No, I'm actually kidding, so we don't have this one. You just use a regular uh, QWERTY keyboard. And um, uh, how it works is that the input system you're using shows uh, a suggestion. So this is uh, um, on uh, Linux, for example. Uh, I just type, for example, N and H, and it's smart enough uh, that it can suggest uh, Ni Hao, so just the first letter of each uh, character is often enough. So you can write uh, like a whole sentence by typing uh, just uh, not even 10 characters. So it's, uh, it's actually very fast to write in Chinese, even faster than writing in English. Or uh, you can also spell it ent entirely. And uh, since there are uh, similar, for example, this one is Ni Hao, this one is uh, Ni Yao. So this is actually not an H, it's a, a Y, but it sounds similar enough that uh, uh, phone suggested because maybe you misclicked. Uh, he wanted to click here and got this one. So basically you just write using pinyin and then you select 
So on the keyboard, you can press one, two, and then spacebar to, to enter. So it's actually very effective. And um, I was talking, um, so this was about writing Chinese. Uh, there's also spoken Chinese. That's another uh, kind of word, in a, in a way, uh, because there are seven to 10 dialect groups, depending who you ask. Uh, luckily, there's uh, one main one, which is Mandarin. So Mandarin only refers to the spoken Chinese. And uh, um, so all, uh, everyone in China using the same system, right, simplified and traditional. And, um, but uh, even if they all write the same, they read in different ways, so they pronounce different ways. So two thirds of them, luckily, they speak Mandarin. And as you can see here, so all the brown one here is like where we speak Mandarin. And uh, then we have here this part for red thing uh, is where we speak Cantonese, uh, which is not uh, uh, the second biggest. Uh, is actually maybe third or fourth biggest, but it's kind of popular because this talk is spoken in Hong Kong and Macau. And uh, so Mandarin, yeah, it's the most commonly used uh, and uh, spoken mostly in the north and it's spoken by about 1 billion people. And it has 400 different syllables, but when you start including the tones, they go up to 1,300. But if you remember, we had something like uh, 15,000 characters. So it means that for each uh, possible syllable, you have at least 10 characters. And um, so this uh, accent, different accent that I was saying, uh, we saw some of them already. These are called tones. And Mandarin has uh, four of them. There are languages that have uh, up to 10, 12 uh, tones. It's very complicated. This is actually even, even for me, it's like very complicated. I don't know this too well. But basically, the first tone is kind of high and flat. The second one is rising. It's uh, like a bit in Italian when you ask a question, or even in other languages, I think even in English, like at the end of the sentence, you raise the tone when asking a question. So it's a bit similar. The third, it goes down and up. And the fourth, it is like falling tone. And the fifth is neutral. And uh, I have here. Okay, so you can see that here the tones are more or less all used. So here another four. So the third one is actually more most popular. The third one is like less popular. This is four characters. The fifth one is not uh, used in uh, standalone characters. It's mostly used in uh, words uh, of two characters. The second one often has the fifth tone. And uh, so the problem is that uh, having a limited set of syllables, uh, you get a lot of uh, homophones. Uh, so uh, it's character that they have the same, character or words that have the same uh, sounds. And uh, by combining two characters, as I was saying before, you can reduce the conflict. But you still have uh, some, for example, this one, Moody, means uh, goal. And uh, this one here, pronounced Moody, again, it means graveyard. So you might talk to someone about uh, your goals, and uh, you might misunderstand and think you're talking about your graveyards. And uh, another interesting thing, if you remember this character is the possessive particles we saw before, that before was called de. So there are also some characters that have different pronunciation depending on where you use it. So there are like some tricky things. And um, okay, so let's go here a bit, and then we are almost done. So, okay, here I was starting tired to use matplotlib, so I made an histogram uh, in SQL. So here I'm selecting all the characters that have the same sound. So there are 101 characters that have these sounds. So all these characters you see here, up till this one, they all are pronounced E with the uh, fourth tone. And uh, there are 94 that are pronounced like this, and so on. And also you see, so if you are like me and uh, you cannot distinguish the tone too well because it's quite difficult, even this uh, G here and this G here, so you have uh, more than 100 combined and they are both pronounced G but with two different tones that when someone is speaking fast, it's very difficult to, to distinguish. And um, you see like if you keep going, we get better and better, but still, and actually most of this, so it's like difficult that you get a lot of, uh, so of this one, 
many characters are not so common, so usually, and you can understand by context or the fact that they are words. And we can do the same thing for words. And uh, as you can see, combining words, uh, combining characters to make two character words reduce the problem a lot. So here, uh, we only have a few duplicates. And in most cases, like one word is very common, the other are not as common. And, uh, and to conclude the talk, uh, I want to show you this uh, uh, poem, uh, which is called uh, The Lion Eating Poet. Um, is a story, so this thing you see here, is this story, it doesn't make much sense, it's like in a stone den, a poet called uh, Shishi was uh, a lion addict. And then he found ten lions and he wanted to eat them and kill them, and he did a lot of things. And um, so this is all fine and interesting, uh, until you want to read this thing, because uh, this uh, whole thing is actually pronounced like this. <laughs> so if you don't know tones, uh, you basically get a big pile of she. Uh, and that's a bit problematic. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that luckily doesn't happen too often, uh, because most of the time you can understand just with combining two characters. So I think that's it. Do um, you have any questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, usually we try to explain to everyone that Python is perfectly legible and in your quite in one of your first uh, slides you shown us that it is not really legible. Well, it is not if you don't know Chinese. Once you yeah, yeah, yeah. Chinese. <laughs> with the hello world. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Thank you. Uh, I have a question in uh, European languages. Professional typers can type on a keyboard without looking on a keyboard and yeah. without looking on the monitor. Uh, so just copying some sheet of paper, some yeah. text. Uh, in, is it possible in Chinese? Is there a system of text entry that is uh, independent from some pop-up on your keep on your display? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, uh, you, you can usually so uh, after a while you type, uh, uh, you start learning the order uh, of the suggestion in the pop-up. So for the most common words. Uh, you know that the one you want is always showed up as second or third, so that might solve the problem. But uh, I never tried typing Chinese without looking at the monitor. But otherwise, it's, uh, it's actually like the guess, it also depends what input system you're using. Like some are like really, really good at guessing. And as I was saying, like uh, uh, you, you can just enter, for example, here, just the, the first character of the, like, for example, this one is Ni Hao. So if I just enter NH, it already knows like the most popular is this one. And then this other one are like different. But if you, for example, this one is like a new high. So uh, this one, if you type it like, uh, for ex like ex extended, like with all the letters, this one will most likely be the first, uh, the first word. And the cases uh, uh, where uh, you have uh, different words, uh, uh, with uh, multiple characters, different words uh, with the same uh, pinyin, uh, they are reduced. I think there are also some systems where you can also enter the tone to make it even more um, more accurate. Because you see here, I'm writing ni hao, but I'm not specifying the tones. So there might be other words that use ni hao with different tones, but I don't know. Uh, but I think some system you can also put the tone. So basically, the only ambiguous cases are uh, this one that I show you here. And even in these cases, one of the words is probably quite common, the other are like less common. So maybe I think you can do it. Other questions? Here. Do you have any particular strategies to re remember ideograms? Because I try to learn Japanese yeah. and kanjis were kind of a mess. <laughs> yeah, kanji is actually one of the most difficult, because I'm learning also Japanese now, and kanji is supposed to be the most difficult thing, and since I come from Chinese, for me it's actually the easiest thing, because uh, when I try to, to read Japanese, like Japanese kanji, even if I didn't know 
all the Chinese one and I didn't know the Japanese one, just by doing like a multiple choice thing, I was able to guess almost 60, 70%, even without knowing any Japanese. So that helps me a lot. Um, so the technique to remember what I use is these apps here, in particular Memrise. Uh, they use, uh, it's called a space repetition software. So the basic idea is that when you learn something, uh, there's like a period where the memory starts decaying. And uh, uh, at some point, you forget it. Uh, if uh, before it reached the point where you forget it, if you see it again, it will spike up and then start going down slowly. And if you see it again before you forget it, it will go up. And this going down, it gets slower and slower and slower. And this uh, space repetition software, they basically calculate how long it takes for you to forget. And they show you the word before you do. So if you practice every day, and this is what I've been doing, uh, is this today is like, uh, I did like, uh, 1,370 days every day studying Chinese, and I usually learn about 10 new words every day. Uh, depends on the period, like sometime less, I just do reviews, sometimes I even learn uh, new words. Uh, and by using this software, uh, I find it very effective. Even when I went to Japan the first time, uh, I learned all the hiragana and katakana, uh, in, like in three days, uh, I learned all of them. Like uh, a language with like uh, hiragana and katakana are like uh, about 50, uh, 50 characters. For Russian, that is like uh, 20, 25, 30. Uh, you, you can learn that in a week uh, going like on your own pace. I find it uh, really, really effective. Uh, Duolingo uh, is better if you want like sentence uh, structure. Uh, or this one, this is like similar to Duolingo but specific for Asian languages is also very useful. So. That's why I find this app like very effective, like more than studying on a book or something, because it really takes a lot of memorization. Okay, other questions? Yes. <coughs> Thanks for the talk, uh, but how exactly did Python help you to learn Chinese? Uh, yeah, the, the, main, the main thing is like, uh, so now I, I didn't show you the, the, like uh, all the, the code I, I wrote, but the main idea is basically I took the C edict and uh, uh, other sources and I created this database. So when I was, especially at the beginning when, when I was learning all these new characters that I didn't even know like, uh, for example, what's the top part, what's the bottom part. Like right now, uh, like for example, this one, the bottom is the art radical and uh, this one is the self radical, should be. So now I don't need it anymore. But especially at the beginning, I wrote this, uh, uh, tools uh, to help me, so I could just enter this uh, character and it will tell me the meaning, uh, it will tell me uh, what's the pinyin, it will tell me what radicals it was made of uh, and what was the meaning of the radicals, so I can also figure out which one was the phonetic one and which one uh, was the semantic one. And then it could also suggest similar words, uh, like for example we saw um, somewhere here, uh, um, like for example, this one. So for example, when I learn this one, I look up uh, all the words that start with this character and uh, I find all these other words that I didn't know before, but I know all the character. So when I combine, it's like very easy to learn new words just by combining characters that you know. So basically I wrote uh, these tools for myself and also like as a, because I find that when I want to learn something, trying to write a program that does it, is a very effective way to make sure that you understand the problem because if you can t teach you teach it to the PC, then it means that you have to have a certain uh, degree of knowledge before writing a program that does it. So by doing this, I was learning, but I also had this tool that helped me a lot, especially in the beginning, uh, finding all this connection and understanding all the hidden meaning uh, that are behind every characters and words and radicals. So that's what I, what I did, and that's why Python helped me. And uh, as I mentioned in the, one of the first slides, the fact, uh, like Python 3, the fact that it has Unicode support, that I can type string with uh, Chinese text in it, and I can print uh, Chinese text in, in the terminal, it looks like this. I don't get like a, a series of uh, Unicode escapes or code points or byte escapes or other weird thing that I cannot read. The fact that uh, uh, Unicode is like uh, seamlessly integrated in, in Python uh, allows me to deal with uh, this text uh, like very, very easily. It's just like using uh, Latin alphabets. So that's what really helps me. 
And it's something that I probably wouldn't be able to do with uh, other languages or like more like with more problem. Okay.